Good evening. Does it I am honored. Just okay. All right. I'm honored and uh, humbled that you would have me here on this very, very special day of the year. Our scripture reading is going to be from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. And let me see if I can, maybe I should just read this off the screen. And um, it reads as follows. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let us pray. We pray that you would bless these words to our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirit this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. It was the summer after my seventh grade year in school. Any seventh graders out here? Got a couple? Well, maybe not. Maybe some close to it. A at any rate, that summer was the first time that I ever got a job. And I was only like 12 years old. We were getting paid under the table. It wasn't legal for us to be working, but they were paying us illegally and doing some other things they shouldn't have been doing. But, but I was working for this linen company in North Jersey, me and my buddy Danny. Uh, it was a company that delivered linen to restaurants and picked up the dirty linen, took it to a commercial laundry. So uh, the job was twofold. We would take clean linen into the restaurant. We would take dirty linen out, put it on the truck, and the truck would go out to some kind of a commercial laundry. Well, my job and Danny's job was actually to go into an outdoor shed that had housed all this filthy, dirty linen for a week. All sorts of things were in that linen. Uh, uneaten food, rotted wheat, salad dressing, and other kinds of stuff that curdled. The, the dirty linen would attract flies that laid eggs, and, and, and there would be maggots all throughout the shed. And there were mice and rats that also came to feast on what people hadn't eaten. Our job, seventh graders, was to go into these sheds, pull out this dirty, filthy linen, and sort it by color, by size, by type, aprons, uh, banquet cloths, tablecloths, dish towels, you know, all, all, all these kind of things. We would sort them out, tie them up in the bundles, and then some other guy would come in a truck, pick it up, and take it to the lawn. Well, the first day on the job, I'll never forget it. We're in this parking lot, Danny's Steakhouse in North Jersey. I don't even know if they're still in existence. It was a Monday, which meant the restaurant was closed because in those days, I don't know what it's like today, we, we need some help here? Okay. That's okay. Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right. It's Danny Steakhouse. Got it? It, it, it? In those days, all restaurants in North Jersey were closed on Monday. So we're out in this parking lot under the heat of the summer sun. We got there at 7, 7.30, and we're sorting this linen in the parking lot under the sun 
for hours on end. In fact, the boss thought it was such a good idea to keep sorting linen in that parking lot that he had the other truck drivers bring linen from the other restaurants so that, so that we could sort it there. We were so thirsty, but we couldn't get into the restaurant to get a drink. Why? Because it was closed. That's exactly right. I was never so thirsty in my entire life. I thought I was going to die. But you know what? That thirst I experienced that summer day after my seventh grade year didn't compare to what Jesus suffered on the cross on Calvary. That thirst was nothing, nothing compared to what our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, experienced in paying the price for our sin. Now, when I say that, I say that both physically and spiritually because that's how Jesus was thirsty. He was thirsty physically. Um, there's a psalm, I believe I have it up here, Psalm 22, which is a prophecy about our Lord's physical suffering. The psalmist writes, my mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. That was physical thirst. That's what Jesus experienced on the cross in fulfillment of that prophecy. But you know what? As bad as that thirst was, it didn't compare to the spiritual thirst he was suffering on the cross that day. You see, on, on the cross, I, I left out a verse, excuse me, I'm going to read it because I have it written out for me. On the cross, there was one thing that Jesus did get to drink. It wasn't water. It was the cup of his father's wrath. In John chapter 18, verse 11, I don't know if you remember the account of the arrest in the garden, but if you recall some of the things that happened, Peter took out a sword, and what did he do? Cut off the ear of, of the servant of the high priest. And, and when that happened, Jesus healed the ear, but then he told Peter, he said, put your sword away, because don't you realize I have to drink the cup that the Father has given me. So there was one thing that Jesus got to drink. It wasn't water. It was his Father's cup. The cup of his Father's wrath. In fact, John writes about this same cup in the book of Revelation. And we, we read, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. Do you know what that means? It means what Jesus drunk on that cross, what he drank, was the full strength of his Father's wrath, not just for the sin of the end times, which the book of Revelation is about, but the sin of all times. And that includes you and me. He drank the Father's wrath for your sin and my sin on that cross. And not only would that obviously not quench his thirst, it would make him thirstier than we could ever imagine. It would almost be like, in fact, it, it would be a lot worse than a sailor being stranded in the middle of the ocean and trying to quench his thirst on salt water or seawater. Not going to happen. Just going to make him thirstier. Just, just going to dehydrate him. Jesus was drinking something far worse than ocean water. He was drinking the cup of his father's wrath. The irony of our Lord's thirst is incredible. You know what I mean by by irony? It's is is that is that is are you good with that word? Irony is like like this is unbelievable. This is like crazy that it's happening. Think about this for a moment. Here's Jesus on the cross, and, and he says that he's thirsty, 
And, and what does he get for his thirst? What does he get? He gets a measly sponge full of wine. And is it good wine? No. It's cheap wine. It, 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 it's sour wine. It's, it's vinegar. Think about that for a moment. They're given the Lord Jesus a sponge full of cheap wine, and this is the man who created a hundred gallons of the best wine that anybody had ever tasted. Do you remember where that was? The wedding at Cana. That's exactly right. The irony, and that's what I mean by irony, is incredible. But, but there's something else going on here in terms of the irony, and, and it's this. Jesus says, I'm thirsty. Do you remember the time when he was at a well in Samaria and this woman came to draw some water out of the well? And, and what did he say? He didn't say, I'm thirsty. He said, give me a drink. Now, he could have quenched his own thirst. I mean, if he could have created, you know, 100 gallons of, of, of wine at Cana, he certainly could have could have taken care of his thirst. He, he's asking the woman for a drink because he wants to tell this woman about the water that he has to offer to her. And, and, and so we read, when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, will you give me a drink? And Jesus answered her, and he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Here is the Son of God who came to give you and me living water. And he's thirsty. Here's Jesus nailed to a cross who is dying to give us the water that will make it possible for us to never be thirsty again. And here He's thirsty. You see, that, that's the essence of our Lord's death. He suffered everything that we should have suffered in our place so that he could give us this water that we could drink and we would never, ever be thirsty again. Oh, he's not talking about physical thirst. He's talking about the more important thirst, which is spiritual. One other thing. In John chapter 7, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Anybody you know what that's a picture of? The heart pool in Watkins Glen. I, when I saw that, I could not, I'm a lover of the Gospel of John. And when I saw that hard pool, I said, I'm taking, not I'm taking this picture, I'm going to use this picture. I just, I just love that because it's a beautiful part of God's creation that illustrates exactly what it, what it is that Jesus came to give us. Living water. And John actually goes on and he says that, um, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John is soaked with water. Water is in almost every chapter of the Gospel and all different kinds of, of, of situations. Um, it's only John who gives us this part of our Lord's ministry where he talks about Jesus saying, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now I want you to see something. Back to our passage for just a moment. When he had received the drink, and you know we know from the other Gospels that he tasted it, but he didn't swallow it because he was going to suffer. That's what God had called him to do, his father. When Jesus received the drink to his lips, he said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. No. I, this is where the English translations have sort of put a word 
into the verse that's not there. And that word is his. What, what the words literally read in the, you know, you know what language the New Testament was written in? What, what language would that be? Greek. That's exactly right. In the Greek text, it says, with that he bowed his head and gave up the, the, the spirit. He gave up the Holy Spirit. It wasn't enough that, that, that he was separated from his father when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For those moments on the cross when Jesus took our sin upon him, not only was he separated from his father, he was separated from the Holy Spirit. He gave up the Holy Spirit so that he could give to you and me that same Holy Spirit to drink of. Now, I know we just read a passage from Luke where Jesus said, I commit into your hands um, my spirit, but commit and gave up are two different words. These were two separate things that, that were going on. He did pray, I commit, I entrust my spirit to you. That's exactly right, out of the Gospel of Luke. But here, John is talking about something different. Not talking about that. He's talking about Jesus Unbelievable. Giving up the Holy Spirit. It, think, it, with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, they're one God. I, I, don't ask me to explain how you do that. All, all I know is, is that it must have caused him oh, so much, so much more suffering. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Are, are, are you thankful to the Lord Jesus tonight for, 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 for what he's done? Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just incomprehensible the suffering that he went through for our sin and then it's John who tells us this no one else after Jesus gave up the spirit after he died one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear and it brought a sudden flow of blood and what water only John gives us this detail. I'm not a doctor. No, I'm not a doctor of medicine anyway. Um, I, you know, I've heard all sorts of different medical explanations that this water came from a, a sack or, or around the heart, and that may very well be, be what, what, what happened. But in the Gospel of John, it's more than just physical water. It's what the water represents. We, we know what the blood represents. The, the, the blood was the final picture of Jesus paying the price for our sin. And the water was a picture of him giving up the Holy Spirit for us so that we could have eternal life. Because water, water, if you remember, is a part of being saved. Verily, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. I, I don't believe that John is talking about physical birth. Some do, and if you do, that's fine. But I understand John to be saying they are born of water, even the Spirit. Water and Spirit are the same thing. When, when Jesus gave up the Holy Spirit, it was so he could give us that same Holy Spirit that would give us new life. Born again and born from above. So the blood... When he thrust that spear in, by the way, the Romans didn't do that. Why did he do it? Everybody's got all sorts of different explanations. Well, they were trying to hasten his death because of the holy day. Maybe that was a part of it. But, but God used this picture in an incredible way. The blood paid the price of our sin. The water is the eternal life. The living water that Jesus died to give us. Water that we could partake of. And we would never, ever, ever thirst again. Amazing. That day in North Jersey at Danny's Steakhouse, in the parking lot, under the heat of the summer sun, after about three or four hours, we thought we were going to die. All of a sudden, this restaurant worker comes out the door with a bag of garbage heading for the trash cans. And we looked at him, 
And he looked at us, and he said, Agua? <laughs> you know, and we said, see, see, see. Agua is water. See is what? Yes. Now, had it been a different restaurant, you're going to have to bear with me. Had it been a different restaurant, um, maybe the worker would have said, um, Shoey? <laughs> and we would have jumped up and down, and we would have said, should that? Should, uh, should that? Did I get that right? Okay. He came out. I ca he came out with a pitcher of ice water, ice cubes. He had two cups for us. It was the best water I had ever tasted in my life. Until four years later, when somebody else would offer me a cup of water. It was a youth group in North Jersey. They told me about Jesus. I was 16 now. And they told me that Jesus had died, that I could be given water to drink, and I would never thirst again. And believe me, I was thirsty in those days. I was, I was more thirsty for God than, than I was for regular water in the in the parking lot of that restaurant. And God used, God used these kids in, in my life to tell me about the living water that I could drink and receive eternal life. And that's, that's what I did. If you have never drunk of the Holy Spirit, if you have never drunk the living water that Jesus gave up everything to give to you. It's my hope and my prayer on this Good Friday of, of all days that you will drink that cup right now. Not the cup of God's wrath. That will be the future unless you drink the living water that will flow out of our hearts in an even more incredible way than that heart pool in Watkins Glen. And all you need to do to drink of, of this water is to believe that Jesus died on that cross for your sin. That by trusting alone in his death, that sin would be wiped away by his blood. And that you would be given new life. The water, the living water of the Holy Spirit. If you've never done that, it's my sincere hope and prayer that you will do it before you leave this evening. Don't roast under the sun in the parking lot, figuratively speaking, when you've got water that you can drink that will quench your thirst forever and ever. That's what Good Friday and Resurrection Day this coming Sunday is all about. Let's pray. Father in heaven, when we think that your son was not only separated from you for a short period of time on that cross as he carried the load of our sin, but he even had to give up the Holy Spirit for a time as well. That, that is incomprehensible to us, but we thank you and we thank him and we know the Holy Spirit had to have been grieved in leaving Jesus at that time as well. Oh, Father, thank you for your sacrifice, for the Spirit's sacrifice, and for your Son's sacrifice. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.